The RS200 was designed to be nothing other than a rally car. It didn't have to look like a Sierra or an Escort or something that had to be sold in the showrooms. Much like the Lancia Stratos and the 037, it was designed to win rallies. It was a prototype in the correct sense of the word. But of course, through those homologation rules, Ford had to build 200 of them, so they had to be road cars as well, leading to those extraordinary street versions. This is one of them. And I'm going to drive it. I've always wanted to do this. What a rattle box. I think we're going to have some fun. Good God. So, Stig Blomqvist. Callie Grundle, the people that kept me awake at night when I was a kiddie watching rallying on BBC Two, finally get to try and be you. Look at this driving position, look at this cabin, tiny. See if we can not spoil it. Oh, it's hilarious. Actually, see too much out of it. Oh, it's just a collection of really nasty noises. But you know what? Nasty noises in the context of a Group B car. Good noises. The RS200 was designed to be functional. It had short overhangs and enough intakes to ingest massive amounts of air. Not the easiest car to stall I've ever driven, though. Got the handbrake. Does the handbrake? Well, hope the handbrake works. So as I try and kangaroo through southwest London's suburbs, maybe time to think about the specification of this car. The engine, and this is where we're going to be a bit geeky. The engine of this car is 1.8 liters. As a child, I got this all a bit about face. I thought this had a Sierra Cosworth engine. 2 litre with that famous Cosworth block that went on to fire everything from Sierra Cosworth, Sapphire Cosworth, Escort Cosworth, you know, the definitive four cylinder engine. This is different. This is called a BDT for the geeks out there, and it's based on the famous BDA, which was the engine made famous in the Mark II Escort. So it's immensely strong and could produce enormous power. As many of you will know, the RS200 had a very short rally life that we'll discuss in a minute. But it went on to do many other things, including Pikes Peak and Rallycross mainly. And the BDT apparently, legend has it, can produce up to 800 horsepower. But this one is a stock road car. It's owned by Ford in the UK. It has about 250 horsepower, maybe a little less, about 200 foot-pounds of torque. And it weighs about 1150 kilograms. So it's not that heavy, but it, it, it's no great fireball. Top speed, they claimed, a little over 140 miles an hour, but 0 to 60 in five seconds because of the four-wheel drive system. The four-wheel drive system. This is where the RS200 is fascinating. So much like the Stratos, Ford decided it wanted a mid-engine car with a short wheelbase to be able to change direction. Rallying is, after all, all about direction changes in a car that's agile, easily agitated. So it went down the mid-engine route, but for weight distribution, it put the gearbox ahead of the engine. So, underneath this gear lever here, there's a great big lump. You'll see it in a second. That is the gearbox. So the gearbox is there, and the engine's behind me. It's an inline four-cylinder. So what happens in the RS200 is that the power is taken forwards to the gearbox, and then taken back to the back axle. Now, how can I describe this to you? It's like a Nissan GTR going backwards. So an RS200 going forwards is almost identical in terms of layout as a GTR going backwards. It does mean there's quite a bit of transmission noise and clonk and rattle, all these half shafts and prop shafts trying to get power to somewhere odd that it doesn't want to go naturally. It just makes it the most 
fascinating bit of history. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I wish videos did smells because this just smells of motorsport. It smells of motorsport goodness. Today the RS200 strikes an interesting shape on the road and here on its own. It doesn't actually look that old, partly because many modern performance cars now have gaping mesh covered holes like this 26 year old car. The machine itself was assembled at the Reliant factory, yes the same people that built the famous three wheeler and the finish was, how can I put this, rough and ready, but it was designed to rally not to win a panel gap competition. The interior on the 200 road cars was a smash and grab raid on the Ford of Europe's parts bin, but it kind of worked. The rest was pure motorsport fantasy. Twin coilovers at each corner and a vast single piece rear clamshell that gave excellent access to the engine bay. The RS200 appears dumpy to those who don't know but beautiful to those of us who do know. It's a fascinating car to drive now, the RS200. Terrible at low speed, but once you get it up on its toes, the inherent rightness of the size and weight distribution shines through. The four-wheel drive system makes it want to understeer, a trailing throttle into a turn sorts that out, then full power brings it straight again. It feels like it could handle 750 horsepower, which is exactly what it ended up doing at Pikes Peak with Stig. But the RS200 story is one of pain and mistakes. Its development was painfully slow. It didn't manage to compete in a World Championship event in 1985, debuting in 86, by which time Peugeot's 205 and Lancia's Delta S4 were unbeatable. And then came Portugal. Shambolic scenes as spectators lined the roadside and attempted to touch 500 horsepower cars as they drifted past them. It was only ever going to end one way and tragically for Ford, it was Joachim Santos involved in an accident that would kill three spectators. Group B was done for. This is the great fascination of the RS200. It was late arriving, it only ever scored a third place on Rally Sweden in 86, and it was actually a little too heavy to compete with the French and Italian teams. But to many people, me included, it still kind of defines Group B, a form of motorsport that captured the imagination so profoundly that companies like Ford felt compelled to drop millions developing a car that didn't even offer a tangible marketing crossover into a production car. As a competition machine and as a sales tool, the RS200 was sadly a failure, a magnificent failure that we should all be thankful for. The same could perhaps be said of this lump of green loveliness. The Audi Sport Quattro was Germany's answer to the Lancia the Peugeot and the Ford. Audi's position within rallying couldn't have been more different to Ford's. The Quattro had profoundly changed the sport in the early 80s, but the company had lost the initiative and needed a car to compete with the new prototypes. But Audi's approach to rallying was more pragmatic. It was building a brand on the back of four-wheel drive and the inherent safety it provided in road cars, and it insisted that its rally car at least resembled the stuff it sold in showrooms. It needed a more powerful, agile machine, so it chopped 320mm from the wheelbase of the standard Quattro, added wider wings, and took a 2.1-litre five-cylinder motor out to 306 horsepower. Like the RS200, Audi had to build 200 road versions to comply with the regulations, but this was a fully trimmed road car with all the luxuries you'd expect from something that was twice as expensive as a regular Quattro. The problem was, the Sport Quattro was now so nose-heavy it understeered like a 911 on two CV tyres. This is one of the 200 Sport Quattros built for the road. In fact, there might have been a few less. There's a bit of conjecture out there, but I don't want to get involved in that particular argument. Um, it feels incredibly special to a rally obsessive like me. This is a very special moment. I've never sat in one of these, let alone driven one. Immobiliser, good 90s style immobiliser. Key in there. No throttle, rumbles a bit. What's it like to drive Sport Quattro? First of all, it feels very contemporary Audi to me and that's in a good way. I love the typefaces on dials, 
it feels tiny in here as well. For the first and perhaps last time, the seat for me, a massive five foot seven of me, is almost at the back of its reach in terms of leg length. Gearbox throw is quite long. Engine is it's lovely. It's laggy, but it's talky and oh, wow. Box. The throw is quite long on the lever and it's got turbo lag, 3000 rpm, it just starts to build, boost gauge flickers, it's quick you know, properly quick. I like it, I really like it. The odd sensation in that through this quicker stuff it's actually quite nice and stable because it naturally wants to understeer because of all that immense weight out front, ahead of the front axle. What did it feel like in period? 306 horsepower, 280, 260 foot pounds of torque, a little over 1250 kilograms of weight. It must have felt like a lunatic. I think we tried to work out how many cars had gone sub five seconds, 62 miles an hour from a standstill on Pittenhead, and it was about five. This was one of the world's fastest cars when it was launched. It still feels quick now. Describe the differences between the two cars. I need to flip it on its head. I'm trying to find the similarities. The RS200 is just a prototype. It is just a little body shell with amazing suspension and components designed to go fast that happens to have a couple of seats in it. This is a proper road car. It's beautifully trimmed. The seats are comfortable. It's got heated seats, electric windows. It's lovely. I could imagine getting in this car driving it to Geneva for the weekend. I really can. I'm surprised at how useful it is. I've read that it was a bit of sort of turbo lag nightmare. Yeah, it's got some lag, but that just adds to the experience. We're going to get in the Sport Quattro. I want lag. I don't want some super responsive, normally aspirated engine. I can get that in a modern car. This is different. And then there's the five-cylinder noise. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I want it. I want it. But it's £149,000. It's impossible to compare these two as road cars today. One is a competition car with license plates, the other a staggeringly fast street car contorted to go rallying. As competition cars, neither of these machines quite lived up to the investment and care lavished on them. But that doesn't matter now, because they remind us of when rallying was great. <laughs>